Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. So again, do we blame the law? No, we blame our own sinful passions. The law just says, this is the will of God, this is the righteous standard of God, but our sinful nature craves to, to cross the line or get as close as we can to it. And Paul's just saying, man, that's where he was at, and that's where all of us were at. Happy Friday. In today's broadcast, we have part two of Pastor Sam's message, Free from the Law. We're in Romans chapter 7, and we're going to take up today in verse 7. Paul is looking at the role of the law in our lives before we were saved and afterwards, and he looks into some of the reasons God gave it to us. So let's listen in. Here's something never to do if you're going out on a date with your wife and you've got little kids, you get the babysitter, make sure as you're going out the door, you don't say to your young ones, now whatever you do, don't put a bean up your nose. Now, why would you? I don't know, but people have, and and here's the deal. I can almost guarantee you, if the last seed you plant in your child's mind is don't put a bean up your nose, you're gonna get a call from the babysitter. And it's going to be like, you won't believe it. Kid put a bean up his nose and I can't even see it. It's so far up there. It's going to be the emergency room, right? So here's here's the, the trick. Just don't even tell him not to put the bean up. He would have never thought of it in the first place. But what it does is it illustrates that, that something so simple as don't do that causes him to think, hmm, I wonder what that would be like. That's, I think, what happened to Eve. God said, you can have anything you want. You can eat anything you want, but don't eat that one tree. And she's like, well, where is that tree exactly? (laughs) Even before sin entered in, she was enticed and drawn toward the inevitable failure that we know led to all of us inheriting a sin nature. Well, in any case, he says, listen, the problem isn't with the law. The problem is with us. What shall we say then? Verse 7, is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. So again, do we blame the law? No, we blame our own sinful passions. The law just says, this is the will of God. This is the righteous standard of God. But our sinful nature craves to to cross the line or get as close as we can to it. And Paul's just saying, man, that's where he was at. And that's where all of us were at. Well, God's commandment, Paul says, not to covet, actually enticed, convicted, and then condemned him. We gave you an assignment last week. I know not all of you were here. And so if you weren't here, I want to let you know what many people in the body chose to do. Now, I'm not asking to see your assignment. I'm not that kind of teacher. But I did give an assignment and we were going to go through Romans 6. I know a lot of people did it because a lot of people have talked to me about how radically it impacted them. The assignment was this. You go through Romans 6, which was all about being free from sin. And everywhere where it said I or we or us, you write your name in. And then you write in that sin that you're trying to conquer or get over or or overcome. And, And listen, 17 times the word sin appeared. So if you wrote that same sin in 17 times and saw all Paul said, speaking for and writing for God about that sin... Well, you will have had some success in dealing with it and putting it in the past. But in case you weren't here or in case you couldn't think of a sin to write in, here's some help. Covetousness. It is our most common sin. Now, I believe that we all have broken all ten commandments, but that's a study for another time. But let me say because advertising is based on the idea that we want what we don't have. That we're not satisfied with what we do have. And even if we think we are, they think that they can ensnare us and convince us, if you'll just spray this on, they'll be all over you guys. You know, wear this and they'll be there. And if you'll drive this or you'll buy that, you'll be fulfilled, you'll be happy until you drive home and see your neighbor has the newer model. And then you'll be like, oh, great. Have you seen that commercial? It's like... 3D TV and they're delivering it and out on this, there's a poster on the truck that says 4D TV and, and it's like, here's the deal. 
Covetousness is such a common sin. We hardly recognize it as a sin. But it is common to all of us. Paul said, at one point, he looked at the law, he looked at himself, and he said, blameless. I mean, I'm doing it. I'm making it. And then he read, thou shalt not covet. And when he understood covetousness, he said, the law killed him. That which was to bring life, it slew him. Now, I was alive, he says, verse 9, once without the law. When could that possibly be? It would have to be when he was a child, prior to understanding the law, prior to being under the law. When you're a child, you just are, well, you're free to fellowship with God. There, there aren't any of the head trips. There's none of the sin, the, the need for forgiveness. You just are, and, and now listen, I don't know where the, the dividing line is. People say, well, pastor, when does, when, what is the age of accountability? When does a child become a man? Well, in the Jewish culture, that's around 12 years old. In our culture, I think somewhere around 25 to 35, something like that. But I don't know when God begins to hold us accountable, but Paul found, and, and I found, there is a time where you go from total innocence to realizing, I'm guilty. They told me not to do it, and, and I didn't just do it. I, I chose to do it. Now, if you ever ask a child who's done something wrong, why'd you do that? Especially if it's really, you know, foolish. You know what the answer is, right? I don't know. I don't know why I did it. Paul's going to say in a minute, I don't know why I do this stuff. I don't want to do it. And the stuff I want to do, I don't do. And I don't know why. But we're almost to that. He says, I was alive once without the law. And when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Looking back. He says, man, it was awesome. But then, then the commandment came. He's not blaming the commandment. He's blaming his own sin nature and is yielding to that sin. The commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Now, he says something else here that's kind of confusing to many. He, he says, the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. If the commandment, if the law can't save us, can't give us life, why does, it even, why does he even suggest, well, it could have? It's because he was a student of God's law. Leviticus 18.5. You, therefore, keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. Five times that's quoted in the Bible. What's God saying? You have my law. If you keep it, you'll live by it. Does God know they're going to fail? Yes. But he's saying, do your best. Give it your best shot. He wants everyone to see how high the standard is and to try to achieve it. And then to come to the only possible right conclusion. I, I just can't make it, Lord. I try, but I fail. And, and it's not an excuse. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not blaming the law. I'm not blaming my sin nature. I'm, I'm taking responsibility. I'm owning my sin. But, but he says, the, the commandment, which, which I thought would bring life, it actually brought death. Now, I want to encourage all of you, and this is just a tip for Bible students, and I'm sure you're Bible students. Here's how I know. There's no way you could deal with me week after week after week if you didn't love to study the Bible. But here's one of the things I've done from day one and I continue to do and I encourage you to do. Get a concordance. Now, if you don't have an exhaustive concordance, you might be surprised when you go to the bookstore. We have them out there. They are like huge. I mean, it's like they, they're, they're massive. But what was done in these concordance, and it was a radical work because it was done originally by hand, is they would take every word in the Bible and everywhere where every word in the Bible appeared and they would write it out. So, so these words, shall live. You would look up the word shall or you would look up the word live. It would be highlighted. It would start in Genesis and work its way all the Revelation. It would show you every single place that that word or those words appear. And, and then it would give you the context by giving you at least enough of the verse that, that it could help you. Now, here's how I've used concordances from day one. Now I have them on my computer. I have them on my smartphone. But, but from day one, I was never good at addresses. And by addresses, what I mean is navigators, they teach you to navigate the Bible like this. You say, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16. Well, I've got one. And I actually know some others, too. My problem is I've never been good at the addresses. 
In fact, if I know where you live, I can find my way to your house. If someone asks, what's their address? I'm like, man, I have no idea. Why? I don't need your address if I know where you live. I just wander around your neighborhood, and that's my style. Uh, and so I, I see your house, and then I'm like, oh, there it is. But, but here's how this works for me in the Bible. I know what I'm looking for. I know the book it's in. I know the neighborhood. And even though I really tried to do it the navigator way, that's not how I navigate the Bible. It just doesn't work for me. So what I do is, is I use a concordance. And, and this is why it's such a great and wonderful tool. You always find something you weren't looking for. The very next mention of living, these two words together, shall live, after Leviticus 18, 5, as in the book of Numbers 21, 8 and 9. Let me read it to you. The Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, he put it on a pole, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now here's why this is so important. He's showing us that, that if a man keeps the law, he shall live, but no one ever has except Jesus. And the very next time those words appear in Scripture, though it's a whole book later, well, he's showing us the solution. The children of Israel had sinned against God. They were murmuring and complaining about God and to God, and he sent fiery serpents into their midst. They cry out, those who had been bitten and not yet died, they cry out to Moses, help us. He cries out to God, help us. And God instructs Moses, make the fiery serpent, make the bronze serpent, and lift it up. And whoever looks at that bronze serpent shall live. Now, here's what they had to do. They had to believe that looking at the bronze serpent could bring them life. And I'm sure there were some skeptics, as many are today, that like, hey, I'm not falling for the look at the old bronze serpent routine. I've been bitten. I need a snake bite, kid, or I need somebody to help me. And they're saying this is the only help there is. Look at God's promise that you, you look at the serpent and th this, you'll live. Well, here's the point and why I share it with you. Besides the fact that I really do want to encourage you to use a concordance, that I want you to see the relationships as you go from the law can't, but here's what can. Jesus grabs this very illustration. And it's in a verse that may sound or should sound familiar to you, but I bet most of you don't know where exactly it is. Let me read it to you. Uh, do I even have it here? Maybe I just know it. And uh, let's hope I know it. Jesus, Jesus says, do I even know? I better look it up. Hey, <laughs> hey, it's one of those days. It's too many services. And, uh, but anyway, at least I, I know the neighborhood and I will find the passage. <laughs> Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now that should sound familiar. It's John 3, 14 and 15. It's right before, for God so loved the world, where he tells us, here's God's motivation for providing salvation. But here's how God provides the salvation. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You have to see it. He's not saying lifted up in a sermon or lifted up in a song, though that is a way to declare him. He's talking about the cross itself. And so that image, that picture in the Old Testament and the promise of life there, well, it's fulfilled in the cross of Jesus Christ. I want you to make those kind of connections when you read the Bible. And I'm certain that over time, if it hasn't happened already, you continue to study through the Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, as you familiarize yourself with the whole, the Holy Spirit promises to bring to your remembrance those things He's taught you. Not just what you've heard from me, but what the Lord speaks to you when, you know how I'll say something and, and the Lord, I know this happens, the Lord speaks to you and he just starts talking to you and then after a minute or two you're like, oh, he's still talking. And, and then you're like trying to figure out where I'm at. That's always happened to me. I know it happens to you. And that's because the Lord has things to say to each of us that he didn't give to me, that aren't in my notes, that aren't in my outline and that I won't even get supernaturally at the last minute. Sometimes he gives them. Sometimes he just deals with you directly, but this he has for all of us. You look to the cross of Christ. You've been crucified with Christ. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but it's Christ who's living in me. 
So we look to Christ. It's the end of the law. He is the end of the law to those who believe. It is the end of sin because you can't serve sin and submit to sin and serve and submit to the Lord. Well, verse 13, Paul asks yet another question. Have you noticed he asks a lot of questions? Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Paul says, look, it wasn't the law. It was my desire to sin within that led to death. Now, we looked last time at, at James 1.14. Each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. We shared it just to say we own our sin. We're responsible for our sin. But let me read you the very next verse. It's James 1.15 if you're a note taker or make a mental note. Some of you can still do that and remember later. Doesn't work for me. Well, then he says, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Here's the picture. Desire leads to conception, conception to sin, sin to death. The thought is planted or just comes into my mind. I can rebuke it or repent of it, ask God for forgiveness for it instantly, and it's over in an instant. Mature, or, or it means still enticed. He, Paul is acknowledging here in this latter part of the chapter a battle we all face, an internal battle, that between our flesh and the spirit, that between our spiritual nature and our carnal nature. And he's saying, listen, you're going to read it and, and you've experienced it. There's that part of you that just wants to do the right thing, that just wants to please the Lord. And yet you, you, you know that you've sinned. And then you're like, well, I promise I'll never do it again. And, you, and then now we're over to the law. And he's like, there's death in sin and there's death in the law. There's only life in Jesus. So the law is spiritual. But I'm carnal, sold under sin. For what I'm doing, I do not understand. I mentioned it. You ask a kid, why'd you do that? He'd go, I don't know. Paul's saying, I don't know. I don't know why I do these things. For what I will to do, what I want to do, that I don't practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. I can see God's righteous standard and I realize I'm not making it. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells in me. Now, he'll say this twice, so don't misunderstand it. He's not saying somehow it's not his fault. Oh, it's just sin in me. No, he's responsible for his sin. But he's saying my carnal nature, my sinful nature, it didn't seem to get the memo that we're dead to that. I'm living for Christ. But my sinful nature says, hey, I kind of like control. I like to dominate. I'd like to do that again. So he says, it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells in me. For I know that in me, in my flesh, dwells nothing good. For the will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Paul confesses the law is good, the law is spiritual, but he's carnal and sinful. The evil things he hates, he does. The good things he wants to do, he fails to do. He's describing a battle within that rages within each and every one of us. I find then, he says in verse 21, a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. There will always be temptation. Here's one way this is fleshed out, experienced by us. God wants to use all of our lives and is using most of them. If you don't end up serving the Lord in some capacity, I will not have achieved God's plan for my life and God's goal for yours. And that is, well, this whole thing is about equipping the saints. That's you for the work of ministry. But here's what happens. As you begin to minister, God really does use you. You're like, as Summer was saying, well, I don't know how he could use me to reach a people that I have nothing in common with except I'm a sinner. But, but the, the deal is, is God does use us if we'll just say, here I am, Lord, use me. And as he does, we are always prone to pride. We're always prone to relive the experience. And I know you've seen it or heard it, maybe even done it. You tell the story of some wonderful thing God did in your life. And the first time you tell the story, God gets all the glory. And the next time, 
well, God's still getting the glory. And then the next time, well, it's mostly God. But, you know, I was praying a lot. I, I had kind of got into this thing where every morning I was getting up early. And so you start to think maybe it was God and me. Yeah, God used you. But let me assure you, it was God using you. And were he not using you, you could not do one thing that would please him or benefit or bless others. Oh, I'm not saying that, that a non-Christian can't give to the poor or care for other people. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, it still falls short of God's intention. There's still sin in it. The motivation or the, the pride that comes from it. Or, or, and I'm not saying everybody does this, but people do good because it makes them feel good. Haven't you ever said that or heard it? I just feel so good when I'm serving or when I'm giving or when I'm generous. But that's not why we're doing it. So we'll feel good. We're doing it because that's showing the love of God in a practical way. All that to say, Paul says evil is always there. There's always the accuser. There's always the temptation. And he says, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? It's a gross and graphic description as he says, wretched and body of death corrupt, defiling, decaying. You know, to a Jew, to step on a grave was defiling. Then they'd be unfit to go to the feast and the festival. They would have to go through this whole cleansing process. That's why when people were coming for the feast and festivals, they would go out and they would clear all the roads and they would look for any graves because sometimes people died and they just buried them on the side of the road there or in a field off to the edge. They wanted to make sure no one accidentally was defiled. And he's saying, look, I don't have to touch death to be defiled. I have a body of death, corruption. I, I, I'm a wretched man. Paul came to see that, that his estimation that he was blameless was far from true. Well, listen, Jesus addresses two churches. Well, he has seven, but addresses two churches in the book of Revelation to one that was doing all the right things, the church of Ephesus. He has this to say, I see what you're doing. He commends them for it. They were fruitful. They were faithful. They were doing all this stuff. But he says, I have this one thing against you. You've left your first love. Their motivation for doing all the right things was no longer love for Jesus. They, they just knew it was right, so they did what was right. We want to make sure that doesn't happen to us. If it happened to them, it can happen to us. To the Laodicean church, he says, because you say I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched. It's the only other place the word appears in the New Testament. He says, you think you have it together. You have everything this world can offer and you don't see that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, outwardly glorious, inwardly pitiful. A body of death, decaying, defiling, separating. Death always means, as we've seen, separation. And Paul's saying he was separated within. He was torn within between the work of the spirit and the work of the flesh, between the will of the spirit and the will of the flesh. Who will deliver me? Do you get it? Not what can deliver me. Who will deliver me? He's not asking because he doesn't know. He's asking so that he can answer his question. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Only Jesus can deliver us from sin. Only Jesus can deliver us from the law. He is the end of both to those who call him Lord and let him be Lord. So then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Many times as a Christian, I have come across other believers who literally have had the joy of the Lord sucked out of them by their attempts to keep the law, or better put, by their legalism. I've seen believers who've damaged their ability to fellowship because they're too busy judging other believers who don't agree with their own beliefs as it pertains to the law. I've seen these same people damage their witness by placing unrealistic burdens on their friends and family members, and especially their children, painting an inaccurate picture of what the Lord wants from us. And these same people then become dark and frustrated as they realize that they have created unrealistic expectations for themselves, expectations they can never keep, yet think being in God's good graces requires them to keep. And the best advice I can give someone who is caught in this cycle is to point them to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, where it says, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. 
This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.